Hi everybody and welcome back to this episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Nick Ponte and I'm joined as ever with Stephen Clark. In this week's episode we're going to be talking refurbs. We're going to try and give you loads of tips on how to carry out a successful refurb and the whole process involved. Now uh, Stephen, whether we are doing a buy to let or a flip, then we're going to come across uh, refurbs and we're going to need to know how to deal with them. So what give the listeners a bit of a breakdown. But first of all, Stephen, how has your week been? Good, Nick. Um, good to be back recording another episode. Um, it's been a good week. Quite quiet. It's been a bit of time up in Aberdeen middle of last week. Had a lot of viewings. Got a couple of offers accepted. One I'm taking for myself. And I probably have actually passed on to one of the investors in my mastermind group. So ah, it's been quite a successful week. And still looking at funding options for um, portfolio purchase in Aberdeen. So yeah, it's been been quite productive I was, having, I was having a nosy on your instagram and i seen you had like eight viewings lined up in one day i didn't ten. Have that man that's got to be mental <laughs> 10 just cram them in i one after the other so do take you just, food with you do you just bulk them up basically and just go up there for one day and just just rattle yeah. through them Aye, it's quite good because you know your time's limited it's not like there's viewings on your doorstep you, you know you're going up there for to, to take action so I just line them up from first thing in the morning till right through. And if I can cram in a meeting at lunchtime or cram in a meeting before um, I'll leave to head back down the road, then yeah, it's just, it's just man, meetings to meeting. And then it doesn't end because you come back down the road and you're so, ex- you have to go and I've took a video of every single property I saw. So then I sit there and I praise every single one and go through my appraisal process. So it says, it's quite a few on day. Over yourself. So yeah. I, I have made a major breakthrough in my uh, property investing career. Um, I, a discovery that I've made this week, thanks to one of the members on our Facebook group, Russell Godfrey suggested, after I posted a video uh, of me trying to strip uh, wood chip wallpaper, he suggested that I go to Screwfix, get this chemical bottle uh, of solution. It's called uh, Z- Zister, is, no, I can't remember, Sizzler, Z- Zizzler or something like that. <laughs> anyway, if you type in wallpaper stripping solution in the Screwfix website, you will find this bottle of stuff. It's only about 12 quid. He said, try that, Nick. First of all, you need to score it with this kind of machine. It's like a blade thing. Get it scored. And have you ever tried chipping wallpaper, Stephen? It's an oh, absolute- horrendous. Uh, strip, stripping the wood chip wallpaper is just horrible it just comes off in tiny wee sections so got this stuff sprayed on I did a video for the guys on the Facebook group and it, like it's mental it kind of just you leave it for fa- uh, 15 minutes it just seems to disintegrate the adhesive or something like that you go back 15 minutes later get your scraper and it just comes off in like oh, big sections th- this, this sounds like a breakthrough it's a major breakthrough. So thank you, Russell, who is a guy we're hopefully going to be interviewing because if he knows that much about stripping wallpaper, he will provide serious other good value to the list. <laughs> He's definitely on the podcast. So let's crack on with this week's topic then. Uh, property refurbs. Now, you're going to come across this in your, in your profit investing journey sooner or later. Um, and it's important that you know how to deal and tackle with the process. So we're going to dive into a few things here for you. Yeah, I, th- I think this is the, the point that puts most people or most amateurs kind of off. They don't quite know how to price a refurb or, the, or they maybe think it's this big, huge task. But when you, when you break it down and you understand the process of a refurb, it actually isn't that bad. It's, um, it's very simple. So it's not that scary, but obviously there's certain things um, that we can try and help with here. Now, step one, Stephen, like it's quite important to plan as much as possible before you even get the keys. So like a thing that I came across recently, I've just bought a property. It's just a wee one bedroom that needs a full renovation, but it's got a gas pipe going into the property. I want to put in gas central heating, but there's no meter. So Mm. although it's got a gas pipe coming in, I can't actually get supply because there's no meter. So I'm thinking to myself, even before I get the keys, I'm thinking, what can I do here? Because potentially, if I get the keys and phone up Scottish Gas, then you could be talking about, well, it's about eight weeks, seven uh-huh, weeks, to six to eight weeks, yeah. get your meter installed. Mm. So I called them up a couple of weeks ago to try and get that process moving. Uh, I actually didn't get anywhere with it and I, I forgot about it and then I had to basically call back again to get things moving. But things are moving now and it's wee things like that where you, know, you need to think ahead. Yeah, definitely. I think you're right. 
setting the the plan up front, knowing what refit you're going to do, what your exit is, is it going to be a buy to let, is it going to be a flip, start to plan in, you know, what standard of refurb, at what level of refurb you're going to. Because obviously from the viewing, you've done an appraisal of what's going to be required at the property. Um, you'll have looked at the home report and got some tips and hints if there's any roof work needing done, windows, double glazing, whatever you're looking at, you'll have this basic plan um, up front. So you can start you can start getting that plan attack already in place and, and, and start things lined up. What do you use to, to plan? Do you use like a Google Calendar or something like that to try and plan out your stages? Yeah, probably Google Calendar or, or probably the process that we're going to break down at the moment. I think I just do it that often that I just know we put phone and line up at a certain point and then just chuck it in my calendar that I know they're, they're going in at that point and you know, look at the process of who's next or who's before them and what he's done before they go in. So, yeah. So, mainly, I, I concentrate on the kind of buy to let. Um, refurbs and you're not talking about huge kind of structural work or you know mm. generally I'm not having to get planning permission or the rest of it but Stephen you're a bit more kind of experienced in the kind of uh, full flips and refurbs and you know, that's probably pl- something you'll do up front is make sure that you know where, where's your max where's your value going to be adding to the property and if it is going to be through you know a layout change or conversion from a one bed to a two bed or a two bed or a three bed whatever you're going to apply for a building board so it's quite good to try and have that preparation work done up front, have your architect go in and, and, and prepare the drawings and even submit them so you know that it's all, the process has already been done. So when, so we're talking about building, when we're talking about building warrants and planning permission, we're dealing with local authorities, so the council basically, and mm-hmm. quite often they are very slow, especially with their admin. Yeah, um, definitely, so. definitely. So what, so, have, you got any, have you got any tips to deal with that? I mean, like one that I did recently that, that I did, it was uh, I had to put in a steel beam. Now, although it was internal work and it doesn't need planning permission, I knew potentially to get a building warrant for that, it could take about eight weeks to come mm-hmm. through. You know, you could be talking about two months. So rather than wait and just wait for the building warrant to come back from the council, I just kind of cracked on with the work and then just kind of hoped for the best. And then it all went through in the end, but it took a couple of months. Did you get a structural engineer in as yes. well? Yeah. Right. Right. So but I had a lot time for that. I got the architect and all that, and I got a structural engineer. Uh, but obviously, we just we, we've just plowed ahead with the work, and then the yeah. came out. The, the building control came out and just basically okayed, okayed it afterwards and gave it the, the kind of completion certificate. Completion yeah. certificate. But obviously, before that, you're supposed to get the kind of uh, approval from the council to say that you know give the go ahead, aren't you? The yeah, green light. And, and then you give the notification that you've started. But yeah, you're you're 100 right. There are a lot of times you'll if your architect's experienced and you're following the right building regulations and you've got the structural engineer out, you know that it's going to be signed off. Or if, yeah. it's going to be, if it's not, it's going to be minor, minor tweaks. So yeah, you're right. You can just crack on rather than waiting for months to, for the, for the go ahead to then go and crack on, to then go and apply for them to come out and give you a completion certificate. So it's quite good to, to, get, them a, to, aye, to get, get started on the work and then get them to do the completion at the end of the work. I think a lot of people get confused with planning because people think that if you're doing any alterations at all to a property, you need planning permission. But planning permission is only really needed if you're doing something like, say, an extension or something kind of externally to the property, is it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Or if it's in a conservation area or a listed building area, you've got to apply for like, listed building consent and stuff like that as well. Cool. So different, different types. Um, so, right, you've picked up your keys um, and... You've got, you've got, you get now you get access to your property. Now, obviously, when you're around doing the initial viewing, you've got a rough idea in your head, and you've done a bit of a price roughly in your head how much the refurb's going to cost. But what would the next stage be when you picked up your keys? So, I would, I would key box uh, for me is that day one, the key box goes up, the set of keys go in the, next to the property, so you know that everybody can get access. You don't need to worry about keys. You just know the code for the for the key box. It makes it so much easier. Life just is, is oh, it's the best invention ever. Where do um, you so get yeah. these things? Just get them on the internet, don't you? Yeah, screw fix, B and Q, yeah, whatever you are. They're usually about what, 20 quid, 25 quid? Four, four digit combination four digit. Of code. You can actually yeah. get, sometimes if you're in a, say you're in Edinburgh or Glasgow and you're in a, a tenement or a new build or something and you don't want to start drilling into the walls because neighbours could get pissed off and they can report you to factors. I've actually found this thing, it's a key box, but it's like a padlock thing. Have you seen them? All right, no. Rather than screwing them into the wall, which you don't really want to do because that can piss off neighbours, you can get this padlock thing. So what I tr- tend to do is just go and find like a railing somewhere mm-hmm. and just padlock it onto like a metal railing. It doesn't even need to be like right outside the front door. You could hide it down the street or behind a, in a hedge or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my 
contractors always laugh at me because it's like the crystal maze trying to find Nick's key box. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, so day one is always pick up the key box, get, secure the key box, get the keys in there. But I always try and, I'm going to try and say it from a point of authority and say, yeah, I'll try and line up the person to go in and strip it out. But, and I do generally on the day I pick it up. But I love to get in about the rip out. So if I, if I collect the keys on a Friday, you'll pretty much find me on a Saturday smashing up kitchens and wrecking stuff with a sledgehammer because it's good fun and you can fill a skip. So yeah, usually first protocol is line up someone to rip it out and I skip for day one because while this is all getting ripped out, wallpaper getting stripped, wood chips getting stripped, the whole thing's getting stripped out, you can be, be then starting to put in your planning in place by getting the contractors out to, to price for the things that you're going to see coming up in the near future. So if it's plumbing work or electrical work, you can be getting that priced while it's getting stripped out. So you've got that, you're kind of starting to go ahead and start planning out the process. Right, so uh, wait a minute here. So there's two ways of doing this, obviously. What Stephen's talking about here is organizing your own uh, subcontractors, so all your trades, electrician, plumber, etc. What about if you want to go down the route, if you're not so experienced, it could be your first refurb and you don't have all the contacts, then obviously you can just get a builder or a main contractor to do them. Yeah, so, you, so if you're doing it that method, you would line up a, a prepare a, a big scope of works up front um, and go over them with the contractor and make sure you're going into detail because you don't want to leave things out where they're going to leave it up to their own self and that's where they can add on extras. So do a big scope of works, exactly what you're wanting, wanting carried out on the property and then let them go and get a few prices from different uh, contractors to go and price it, get their, their time frame and, and um, price agreement. And I would recommend getting three quotes in. Yeah. So I like, I like to strip out the property um, and be part of that process because I think this is when you always find the little hidden, the stuff that's going to give you surprises. It's like, for instance, the most common ones, if there's been water leaking from the washing machine or the bath waste, you're always going to get a bit of rotten timber. So if you just go in blind and say, right, there's a keys to a contractor, uh, he prices it up, gives you a price at X amount, comes back in two weeks later and goes, oh, well, found rotten timbers, it's going to cost you an extra grand or whatever, then it's stuff that you've not factored in. Whereas on day one, day two, if you've already got this whole thing stripped out, you can go through and assess it, make sure there's no damp issues that you never that you didn't come across, any rot on, any woodworm, um, anything unforeseen that you couldn't pick up on your, on your obviously your walkthroughs at your viewings. Uh, so I, I like to know that quite early on and quickly so you can factor in these costs uh, straight away into your refurb cost. These are all the wee nasties that you come across that uh, quite often like maybe a surveyor and the home report's not going to pick up on. Now, how are you going to find out these things? I mean, if you're inexperienced, you're really going to have to rely on your trades to come across these things. So it could be like you've got the plumber in pulling up some floorboards and he's noticed that there's like, you know, the, 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 the joists are rotten or something like that. You know, that's just what could happen. It's important yeah. to build in, uh, at this point, we should say it's important to build in a contingency, isn't it, to the initial refurb estimation? Yeah, I usually put in 10% on my, on my as a contingency, but you, you know it'll, some, it'll sometimes go more than that. What about you? Do you put in a contingency? How much of a contingency do you put in? Usually 10% as well. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, if you come across a real, a real rotter, then it could really blow the budget, but... Yeah, you know, it's- Yes, yeah, you have to kind of factor that. That that's that's the risk involved in property, or that's where you can maybe exactly. experience up front. Maybe you know you spotted it, and that's where you managed to negotiate the price to suit paying for that that repair. Um, so yeah, I, I like to I like to get assess once I'm on doing doing the strip out and getting that process sorted out and getting the plan and stuff. I like to go for the the higher level stuff. So think about all the big picture, which you should have picked up on your assessment would be stuff like your roof or any damp issues or like windows, double glazing, heating, all that kind of stuff. These are the stuff that you want to try and attack first on your so These things you would be trying to identify at the initial viewing as well, obviously. If you're looking at a roof, what, what are you looking for? Give us some tips here. Looking at the kind of major stuff, how can you kind of, I mean, you just... You can, you can, tell, you can tell by the shape of a roof as well if it's, if it's sagging and stuff that is rotten or it's, you know, the boards are away and stuff like that. You can always tell if it's a bit wavy looking, you can tell. Um, I mean, missing slight tiles and slates aren't the biggie. If they've been missing for years and years and the water's leaked in and it's caused damp and caused the timbers to rot, then you've got a bit of an issue there as well. But you can always pick that up by looking at the roof from the external on and looking up inside the attic space at right. your viewing to factor that cost in. But I mean, funny enough as well, like roofing, people get scared off with these bigger points. And I did to start with my first few reverbs because I used to always look at the roof 
the, the gas central heat and, and the double glazing. And if, and if I had all these things, then I went further with the refurb. But then as you get more experience, you realize these are not that scary either. You can do these, you can factor these costs and then do these things quite cost effectively as well. Um, I, I recently had a refurb last year that didn't pick up on the roof and it was leaking. It was, a, it was a part of it that was leaking. And then the more and more you kept discovering the roof, the worse it was going to get. And it was like, oh no. Um, so it ended up being the whole roof was stripped back, reboarded, re-sheeted, wow. um, battens on a new, a new tiles on. But How much total, did that cost you? It cost four and a half grand. That's so not was not. So people get scared off by roofs thinking 15, 20 grand, that's the black that's art, you can't see it. Is that a house or? Was like, that was a four bed uh, house, detached house. That's a good yeah. price. It was a phenomenal price. And I still, I, use this con- I still use this contractor all the time. I got a price back there for a roof recently. It was for a four and a block cottage flat. So it was only half of the building. And the quote was 16,000 pounds. So this is why it's important to get a lot of quotes, you know, get three quotes in for sure. And we, and we spoke about our kind of power team last week and obviously roof's something that you don't come across that often. So a roofer's not yeah. someone you'll have, you know, you won't have your beck and call doing electrical work or plumbing work regularly. So you, you've kind of got that relationship with them. So roofing one's a bit trickier. So I went to a friend of mine who started up a roofing company and um, known him for a few years. I thought, yeah, I'll support his business. He messaged me when he started up. So look, mate, anything I can give you, I'll happily... Um, give you, I got him out to price this roof, this exact same roof, and he come in at eight thousand pound. And I says, "Look, man, I've got a price here that's coming in at four and a half." And he said, and he started giving me the 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 roofing, you know, the roofing jargon. Yeah, yeah. I want to include this flash and that gully, that gar and that bit, that bit, the lead bit there. I'm saying, uh, two seconds. Let me get back to you. I copied and pasted it from his message, sent it onto the roofing contractor that I didn't know that well, you know. And he was like, "Yeah, mate, that's all getting done." So I went back and says, yeah, he's including all that you just says. So it was important to compare apples for apples, which he made me compare. And I was like, the, the guy's still doing it for half the price and you're supposed That's to be a friend. Point. That's um, a good point there. Compare apples for apples. So make sure when you're getting your quotes in that they're not coming back with different specs and that. Make sure all your prices are exactly the same in terms of what, what's going to be done. Yeah. Um, I, this this, this was, wasn't was factored in the refurb on this actual... Um, this this flip property a couple of years ago uh and it wasn't until it was with the issues with the roof that we thought would have been repaired but it was when we were stripping off the walls upstairs the rain came in and the, the water was just pouring down the walls the the, the brick walls so we we're like oh there's issues there was issues at a few places so it was one that you probably wouldn't have picked up that that easy from viewings but then again it blew the contingency immediately um on that I one, I, I think I seen that one in your Instagram. So it was like, uh, yeah, that's right. You went in one, and it was one day you went, and it was the water was just pure pissing, pouring, down. pouring down the walls. Like, is that the one? Oh my! Aye, aye. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, if it was just one part, you probably could have just botched or repaired it. But the price I was trying to get for the house, I, you know, there's that moral standpoint as well, and making sure you're selling on a good product and making sure that someone's not going to have this issue when they buy it because they're not going to get the same cost that I would have got that. That right. price it probably would have cost them sixteen grand or something. So okay. Um, so, so, so yeah, you're right. looking at making the property wind and watertight, right? So yeah. mainly that's the roof and windows, doors and stuff. Yeah, yeah. gutterns, downpipes, all that kind of stuff. Windows, double glazing doors. Yeah. Um, See, just, just jumping in here for a second, actually, because I want to refer to the Facebook group. Somebody asked a question on the Facebook group, and they want to talk about damp. You know, um, so this would be a good point actually to talk about that because that's one thing that really you should be doing right at the start, because that's, that can be a, a kind of major bit of work as well and can cause it a lot of mess. Um, okay. So he's, he's asked about the different, uh, how do you assess if there's any dampness and stuff? Well, there's, first of all, we should say there's a couple of different types of damp. We've got penetrating damp, which you were talking about, obviously yep. water come from somewhere like the roof, the gutters, the pointing on the walls, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, we've got uh, rising damp as well. Now, rising damp—that's quite a. It's not as scary as it sounds as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, the, the, the damp issues as well. People will be put off by damp issues, and surveyors will often pick them up in the home report and put a two against damp. Uh, but if the, you know, if someone's died in the property and it's been left sitting for a year without heating and ventilation, then the, the property is going to have some kind of condensation What's and damp this? inside yeah. it because of it sat empty. Um, but if you're if you're if you're talking about the things that you were mentioning, like your penetrating damp, there's you always want to find the root cause and the and 
the cause is always the issue, whether it be a gutter and it's overflowing that's blocked or like you say, pointing or a chimney is crap or a lead flashing is away. They're fixing the, the issue is never usually that bad. And if it's, if it's not been leaking or, or penetrating the property for that long, the damage generally isn't that bad either. And when you allow the property to dry out and fix obviously the, the root cause, the issues generally resolve quite quickly. Um, mm-hmm. You have found that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that the the, the 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 damp thing. I just recently had one. People want to give get people want uh, us to give an idea of costs as well. So again, I probably could have got it cheaper, but I just wanted to go with a reputable company just to get the guarantee for the damp proof course. This was a, a rising damp problem, and it cost about five thousand pounds to fix, and that was basically all the walls right the way around the property. Mm-hmm. and some kind of ones that, that run kind of inside as well. So basically what they do is they strip out all the plaster right back to the brick, right up to about a metre high. Uh, the way that they do it now, rather than obviously stripping out brickwork and putting in a new damp course membrane, they actually use, uh, it's a chemical that they inject in. So they drill in all the brickwork and they put a chemical round and that stops the, the, the rising damp. So that's just to give you a, a rough figure that was £5,000 for, for that job. But I think you could probably get it cheaper. Um, mm. But important to get a guarantee with that as well. That's good, yeah. Um, if, well, why don't we touch on a couple of others? So we mentioned the, the price of the roof and the price of the damp. The price of windows and doors always blows my mind as well because when people think of windows and doors, they think of the salesman chapping their, their mums or their grands yeah, Smith. door and quoting them 25 grand for a windows and you're thinking, ridiculous. And I, and I, and I was in that place probably 10 or 12 years ago as well like i'm not replacing windows no that's expensive until the first time you play you you, you replace a window door and you go shit that wasn't that expensive that was cheap mm-hmm. um so i can give some rough prices of stuff i've had over the last couple of years um three bed kind of traditional council house um, yep. you're probably looking at purchasing these for probably about two and a half three grand okay get them first so if you've got a joiner windows and the door that'd be like a upvc door yes probably about what eight nine windows yeah and a door um front and back door you're probably four five hundred quid for a door obviously again it depends on size and you know all the rest of it and the spec but we're trying to give you some help here guys with pricing your refurbs just a rough guide yeah just rough guide i mean that's all that's all very dependent on your contracts and who you who you're using and, and obviously the relationship you've got with the people as well um, so yeah, very rough price. Price, and then you've you, you might I always base a lot of that stuff as well to try and keep the cost right down. That if you have a joiner on site for a few days doing that, then what's his labour rate? Mm-hmm. You know, a couple hundred quid a day. They're six hundred quid for fitting them. So you've knocked down your you know your eighteen twenty grand for replacing windows to really a few grand, which isn't the yeah. end of. So I usually go on about kind of like you say about three hundred fifty pounds a window, yeah. and mm-hmm. your door probably be about five hundred pounds or something yeah. like that. That's okay. a fair price to do them, yeah. Uh, so that's good. That gives us a, a, an idea of that. Um, I think f- from my point of view, when I'm doing the buy-to-let refurbs, uh, obviously I need to make sure that everything sounds, um, you know, structurally, it's wind and watertight. But I generally like to do, with my own personal properties, I like to do a full renovation interior right from mm-hmm. the start. And the reason I like to do that is because I can pretty much get, that'll be me for the next, I know that for the next 15 years, I pretty yeah. much won't need to touch anything, you know, yeah. so... I'm I'm very much the same in my buy lets. I love to do the full full refurb. And even though some of it might not quite need it, and people will be like, oh, why not just leave the bathroom? It's only a rental. But you leave the bathroom in four or five years' time, it's going to start leaking. You're going to need to replace it. So why not just, rather than getting the constant maintenance issues or the constant, oh, the bathroom needs done this year or the boiler needs done next year, if you're cash flowing two or three and a pound a month from that, every year you're taking a huge hit. Whereas like you say, you, if you factor into the cost up front, refurb, but you'd like to think that 10, 15 years of almost maintenance free which is giving you a decent investment return yeah same i mean even like things like we're talking about heating and stuff like, that, like if there's a combi boiler in there and it looks a bit old like i don't know 12 say it's older than 10 year olds yeah. i usually like to just even though it's working sometimes i just like to replace it because i think well it's not going to be long till i get like a bill for that and it's going to be like the first repair is probably going to be about 250 yeah. 300 quid and i can get a new boiler installed for 1100 to 1200 pounds do you know yeah, what i mean yeah. Mm. stuff like that i think it's just if you've got the budget there and for the long term it's worth doing now it's not obviously for everybody but this is the way that we like to do it yeah how would you price the heat system 
what have we got here? We're going to rattle through a few things, uh, Stephen. Your next, your next big one is your heating system. Before we move on to the kind of the fit out, so okay. what would you, what would you price your heating system at? Heating system. What we're we talking about? Uh, well, usually I deal with flats, right? So it's one or two bedroom flats. Um, I'm trying to give well an idea. I would, say, I would say probably for the boiler, all the pipe work, uh, labour, supply, and fit. I would, I would say you would need to allow for about. Two and a half thousand to three thousand, probably three thousand. I would say. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah I, I actually, I actually use a guy from uh, near you, Mister Central Heating. Oh, um, that's the supplier of the the boiler. Phenomenal right? prices. Even when you go online and you look at it, they beat all the like the plumbing suppliers around about me. And um, they do packages on. I like to use Ideal Logics. They give you a seven or eight year warranty on them. Yeah. So Ideal Logic Plus is using my preferred preferred one I go to. Um, they usually do I, a pack. I get, slated, I get slated for using Vaqueras because everybody says oh, they're horrible. Shite. Yeah, they're horrible, <laughs> aren't they? I get such a good price on them, man. You get a five year warranty, and like a five year warranty for me, you know, if I, or even if I can get 10 years out of that boiler. I'm yeah, fine. no, I mean, the, the ideals are given seven, and I think the Baxes are given 10 years at the moment, and the Potters are given 10 years. So you're getting, you're getting some good deals on boilers, and they're obviously believing in their products a bit better. So yeah, I think for the sake of a few hundred quid, like I'll okay, just get so a better I need boiler. A, I need to stop being a tight bastard, start right. cleaning more of my boilers. I think your 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 uh, ideology before with Mr. Central Heating, I'm sure it was coming about eleven hundred quid for your full like radiator package, valves and boiler. It was a cracking price for it. Um and and the, the beauty of this, I don't know, they're obviously not a chain because I used to I'd, I've been through a few times in person when I've got a couple of projects and they go and I'll pick up two or three heating systems. Because I know when I go and I haggle them and they're they're, like, they're, they're brilliant. Typical Ouija's. They want, a, they want a haggle and a deal. It's brilliant. So I'm like, right, I'm buying three heat systems. It's not, I'm not paying 1,100 quid. Give me it. And, you'll, and you'll, next minute you're getting them for you know, another three or 400 quid off them for, for buying a couple. It's phenomenal. Negotiate, negotiate with your suppliers as well. It's worth just asking the question. That's great. Uh, you know, especially if you're buying in bulk as well and you're buying, buying for a few properties. Uh, yeah. Just on so that getting... point about nego- negotiating, just a, another thing we can jump in here. And it's a wee bit of kind of, some people say it's good, some people say it's average, but there's the LNPG discount card, which is the landlord's uh, discount, which you can find out about. Now, I found it good for kitchens because I use Magnet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it's beaten Howden's kitchens. This is one thing I think we're going to do a comparison. I think on the next refurb, I'm going to price a Howden's kitchen. I'm going to price a Magnet kitchen with the LNPG discount. Mm-hmm. It's LNPG in it. That's LNPG, it. yeah. Aye. And uh, this is cost, the LNPG cost about £200 for the membership for the year. And uh, obviously, it entitles you to discounts with a lot of different suppliers. I think Plum World, Howden's, uh, Johnson Paints, mm-hmm. Bathrooms.com, all these suppliers. And, you know, it does give you a bit of savings. So it might be worth looking into as well. Yeah, I mean, on negotiations, I like to negotiate more or, or find the cheaper prices and materials rather than negotiate too much with the with the trades because they're the people that you'll you'll piss off if you're building a decent relationship up with them the price they're giving you they're going to give you a good price if they don't then don't use them go elsewhere but yeah. if you've kind of built these relationships with the guy you've got to trust that they're giving you the decent price or you know compare them or build that build that relationship up with them so yeah I, i'm the same as you I like to try and find the best deals on the materials rather than the labor good, good. um we're kind of on to the the internal Part. Do you want to go on to what you would do next in the refurb then? What would be your first? Yeah, first well, I'm going through this at the moment. So like internally, I'm looking at, I'm going in there, I'm looking at the walls and I'm thinking, you know, can I get away with just stripping off uh, wallpaper and painting over that? Sometimes you'll strip off the wallpaper and it will just like, you'll open up a can of worms. Sometimes you'll strip off the wallpaper and, you know, the plaster just crumbles away. You know, this, this be, laugh plaster is this uh, actual plasterboard? Probably we're talking. We're here. We're talking about laugh and plaster. So right. this is the old tenement properties in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, sometimes when you're, you know, you're chipping away uh, on the, the the wallpaper, especially ceilings. I've had this happen to me before. You'd be, scra- you'd be scraping away a ceiling, and because it's the old laugh and plaster, basically a lot of it can sometimes become detached from the, the laugh. And the plaster can just fall, just like, literally like ceilings just come down. Boof. <laughs> not, not pleasant. No, and, I've, I've took it on board before and a couple of, I was doing two flats at the same time in the same block and I ended up taking it on board to say, do you know what? Screw this. Every time you came in, there was, they were falling off. There was more down. I thought <laughs> it was a horrible job for the labourer, but yeah. stripped the whole lot, all the laugh plastered up, all the wood off the timber. 
and basically started from scratch and it made it so much easier just to reshoot it um, rather than trying to We're talking about here. So plasterboard sheets are only like five or six pounds. That's quite that, exactly. Like being cute. Obviously, it's going to cost some labour on that to put them on, but you just get such a nice, clean start for the plaster. And you, can, and you can go for a tape and finish rather than a plaster finish if you weren't, if you were, if you prefer. True, true. Albeit, if you're going, I've, all, I've had problems in the past where um, you start getting cracks in that along some of the edges for the tape. And maybe it's not been a yeah. good job that I've had, but, um, you know, and you start, I, I just much prefer a, pla- a plastered job. Plastered walls, you just, the, the finish, if you get it yeah. good, you get that lovely, glassy, smooth I'm a, finish. I'm exactly the same. I plastered everything. And I think the joint venture partners I've used in the last few years, they look at me like I've got two heads. Like, why the hell are you flipping plastered every single wall and ceiling? <laughs> Because the finish it gets brand new, it's phenomenal. It looks brilliant. Yeah. Why not? It's a, you know, it's a couple of grand to get this finish on everything that you see. It's yeah. the best finish. Um, so plaster and what, what kind of cost would you be looking at for uh, your two, one or two bed flats? Costs we're talking about. So um, I just did one there recently. Um, it's a one bedroom flat, walls and ceilings right the way throughout. One thousand. What was it again? One thousand eight hundred. So that's uh, a big hallway. Uh, no, I sorry. One thousand five hundred. Sorry. So that was a big hallway, walls and ceilings, a big big living room bay window, walls and ceiling, a bedroom, walls and ceilings, and yeah, that was it. Well, so that was fifteen hundred pounds. So uh, generally speaking, you're probably talking about for, for the big old tenement flats in Glasgow. I I generally do. You could be looking at about 400, say 400 to 500 pound a room. Right, yeah. Um, probably you. I, I probably, yeah. I've, one of my trades that I use on every single job is my um, plasters. I've got a, a, a guy who I used about maybe seven years ago, and I've, and I've all, in fact, maybe longer, and I've used him ever since. He was 100 quid a shift, and he's now 110 quid a shift, and he just sticks with you know, he knows that I chuck on work. He knows that I plastered every single property. So he just yeah. keeps these prices and he just comes in, cracks on and, you know, bless his house. You go, you go with the day rate there? He's, he's one of the only ones I'll keep on a day rate because I know that, I know what he does. I know that he, I'm, you know, well, I know when I look at a house, he'll come well, in and do it. What should we say here? A word of caution to the listeners about day rate versus price for the job. Can you elaborate yeah. on that? The day rates and the hourly rate can run away from you, and obviously it's in it's in their interest to make it last longer. So yeah. their motivation is to make more money. So they're going to drag the job out. <clears throat> so a lot of time you're better getting prices for the job that you're doing. But some of the, you know, I started to find this out, you know, years back when you get you originally get kitchen prices to fit a kitchen, for example. Somebody would say, you know, a couple of grand, and I'm like, but it takes a joiner two days to fit a kitchen. Why the hell is somebody getting? a grand a day in labor like that's ridiculous so yeah. when you actually look at it and you break it down you say a joiner i'm needing you for two days what's your, your labor rate or hourly rate all right it's 160 quid a shift right no problem i need you for two days so all of a sudden you're getting your your kitchen fitted for a fraction of the cost yeah. so there, you've got to kind of weigh up what you're trying to do to what you know what's going to be more cost effective for you but then i can only do that with some of the trades that i use because i've used them for so long and years and they know that they know that they're going to keep getting reoccurring work from me they know that i know my my stuff they know that i'm not going to be a i'm experienced and doing refurbs they know that if they come in and say all right that's me finished pal that's me being two weeks in here and i, and I know it should have took yeah you know a week then they know that you're taking the piss you've just got double what you should have got i think um, if you're experience you should really stick with the price for the jobs and I, personally yeah. I, I prefer just knowing what it's going to cost me for the job if you know sometimes you win sometimes you lose if it just it can work both ways I'm yeah, I agree. He's he's probably only one of one of the only ones I used probably left on day rates, I think. Before we go into plaster, we probably should have done um first fix stuff. So any electrical work, any plumbing work, any joinery work, like um door frames getting changed out, any studs getting removed or put up, stuff like that. All your roughing gets done first before your plastering gets done. Um so then when you're plastered, what we're on next, Nick? One of your second fix? A second fix would be, what's that, putting in the, the radiators and stuff. So you have almost been in putting in all, all the pipe works, but obviously hasn't put in radiators because they'll, the, they'll get in the way of the plaster on the walls. Uh, so you'll come in and put in the radiators. Your electrician will come back and put on the, uh, the sockets possibly, or do you usually wait till after the painting's done for that? Or do you... I, probably, I probably do them either at then and then wrap them 
Aye. He wraps them before they get screwed into the wall. So leave them all hanging, all the faceplates hanging, so it doesn't affect the painting. But at least you've got power for your um, your joiners and your tilers and your yeah. your um, your fit out trades as well. Once all your walls are all smooth and plasterboarded out or plastered, then you can get your kitchen fitter in to do your kitchen as well. That's, that's what, I think that's when the refurb comes together very quickly, and we'll probably skim over this bit because it is the quickest bit. When your joiner's coming in, fitting your um, your kitchen, you're usually getting your finishing work done on your joinery work, your skirtings, facings, doors, all that stuff getting rattled in at the same time as well. Yeah. Um, so the only places that you wouldn't fit your skirtings would be the ones you're laying floors down. So you're laying any hardwood or laminate or stuff like that, um, you would lay your skirt on top of it. But if you're putting carpet in your bedrooms, skirtings all go down first. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. What do you do with kitchens these days? Where are you, where are you getting your kitchens? I'm the same as you, Magnet LMPG, yeah. Right. Um, what's can't, can't that, what's that design are you going for? Does it differ between, obviously, if you're going for a flip higher end or...? Nah, kind of, for my bio-less, I still kind of use a matte grey handleless. Um, rather than having the, the maintenance issues with hand like handles going yeah. you know five ten years down the line when the handles coming off, I like the handleless one. I think that works a lot better. Even for the flips, I'd probably use the same kind of range. Just probably put a better work up on it and better fixes and finishing. I think a thing that I kind of struggled with in the past was see when you're doing a bathroom or a um, uh, or a kitchen. You know, and you're, you're dealing with individual trades for a kitchen, say, so you've got your, your plumber comes in, does your pipes, and then your electrician with your sockets and all that. Then you get the kitchen fitter, who's generally a joiner, comes in and fits that. Then you've got a tiler for your splash mat. So you try to manage all those individual <laughs> trades. is quite difficult. So I've actually found a guy that just does, like, the kitchen, the full thing. And he, he's oh, like a multi-trader. And okay, you might pay a little bit more, but I find that so much, like, less hassle and less stress. That's a good point, yeah. Uh, and it's just, it works for me. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, and as far as kitchens go, for me, for the buy to lets I use just magnet, basic range. Um, it's called the Strata, I think it's called. And it's just the white. It's just a, it's just a white gloss. For the buy to lets on you go, you're going to laugh at me again. <laughs> Tight <keeps> ass. <laughs> Tight <laughs> ass. <laughs> One of my joint venture partners just... Uh, Finished his prop flat in Kurt Liston and he didn't even plaster this, the artex in the ceiling. I was like, you grip it. No, no, I, do that. I do that. I'm not that tight. But what I do is I, I don't include uh, the pelmet and the cornice. So see the bits that run across yeah. the top of the wall units and all that. I don't, I don't, I don't think that. What's the point in that? It just, like, it just adds cost. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need that. You don't uh, need and in a vital let. No, no tenant is going to pick up on that. I, I like to do the little bit of spec. Like, so my, maybe I'm maybe different on the on the site. I'll probably do stuff like the permits, a bit better kitchen range. Like, I'm not talking about a wee bit. I'm talking about the probably difference between your range at the white gloss one and the grey matte ones. Maybe four hundred quid a difference. But I always find that. If that affects the valuation, the value will come back in because you need your money back out. If that affects the value coming back between a hundred grand and a hundred and five or a hundred and ten, all just these wee differences are going right. Okay, it was three hundred quid extra for the kitchen. It was three hundred pound to put spotlights on it. It was three hundred pound extra to put grey paint on rather than white paint. If I added all these wee bits up and they come in at an extra grand, but you get a whole lot of better property, a whole lot. You might even get a lot more rent because it's a higher spec flat, a better quality <laughs> tenant. Who knows? I, I, I always go that a wee bit more for, for rent. I was like, but I yeah. Know, I don't know if it would affect the end value much. I'm not sure if surveyors would take that into account. What spec? Probably, probably right. Probably right. It's probably more for your, your seller. Like you're, you. you're, you're looking at it from. Well, this is, this is another thing to say at this point, right? I mean, Stephen, I know you, you're good with the figures and that. So you won't get, you'll have budgets and you won't get carried away and it'll work for you. And you, you know, more often than not, you'll get most of your money back out. No, like, <laughs> your experience. but a lot of people this is where they fail because they do they love the design aspect of it so they will go in they'll get carried away and they'll start putting in like you know when you hear terrible horror stories of people putting in like you know granite uh, worktops and all that do you know what I mean there's no need for any of that in buy to let no. say no exactly there's no need for that on a flip you can get cool worktops square edge worktops that look the part on a flip right. um, you don't need to go that extra high end unless you're maybe I don't know 300 400 grand properties maybe you can go justify that end but um, yeah, we, we don't need the uh, faro and ball was it faro and ball the paint i uh, use i use faro and ball paint oh you're a snob no i don't i use the fake version so johnston's uh, under the mpg i've got the fake version 
All right. And so the color matched their colors. And I found the, the light gray that I, I, I standardized through all my properties now. So I don't, I don't have to worry about colors. I know, I know exactly what color I get. And it's a far on ball color, but you, mi- oh. you mix on the Johnston's paint and it's brilliant. Um, I'm still on the 10 liter tubs of Leyland white contract, Matt. <laughs> well, actually, the world just opened up and flipping gave me this beautiful gem about two or three weeks ago. I noticed in B&Q that they started to do standardized light gray in, their, in your 10 liter tubs, like your Leyland tubs. Right, right. Two for 20 quid and stuff like that. So it looks like the cost of the refurb's coming down again. One thing I would say is just don't go Magnolia because that's seems no. outdated now. See the amount of people that are, you know, investors that have probably been investing for maybe 15, 20 years and they still lick their properties Magnolia and I'm, oh, it just drives me nuts. Well, and I said that to one. Look, it needs a, when I look at Magnolia now, I, I, I automatically say, it's a refurb. Yeah, it's yeah, a refurb. yeah. It looks so dated, it's unreal. So your builder will probably come around, he'll probably say, so you just want to go Maggie in here? Maggie, I just want to go Maggie. And you're like, no, mate. <laughs> Aye, Jesus, no, no, don't do right. it. Is there anything else on that list you want to talk about? I've got a uh, bathroom and stuff and, and finishes and landscape and curb appeal, but again, it probably more appeals to a flip but uh, refurb of going that more higher end spec, spending a wee bit more money to, to maximise the value and going over the home report as well. But um, aye, certainly for the battle, I think we've pretty much touched all the bases. Um, flooring maybe would be one I'm touching. I like to put you know, hardwood flooring or, or laminate or click lino into the hall and living and kitchen areas, but on um, I bedrooms and possibly living, just car- carpet, cheap carpet. I think someone in the... Well, that it. click vinyl's good stuff, actually. I've been using that myself. Um, it's good quality. It lasts. And it ah, it's very good. It's pricey, but I think when you factor in the cost of the fact that you're not going to have split edges with laminate coming up over the years, it's, it's waterproof, it's, it's hard wearing. I yeah. think you're going to, I think they give 25 year guarantees, which I'm pretty sure you're going to get your lifetime, your investment in it, out of it. Yep, definitely. Okay, so that was brilliant, Stephen. I enjoyed that. I enjoy talking refurbs. I really do. I think we could probably do a lot more on this. Uh, I think we could. I think we could have spoke three podcasts on the refurbs, actually. We, love, we both love a refurb. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Hopefully, you guys got some good value from that. And again, obviously, take our values and our, our, um, our prices for the jobs. You have to take them as our very rough guide because there's so many variables that come into that. Size of property, location, where you are in the country. It's going to probably cost more in Edinburgh than it is going to cost in, like, I don't know, uh, Aberdeen. Well, I don't know. Aberdeen or Glasgow is quite, I can get good prices, but yeah, just bear that in mind when you're pricing. Yeah, and don't come, come The relationship as well you've got with your builder or who your supplier is, but I mean, shop around for your suppliers. Don't just go and take the price you see or, um, like you say, get the CR Smith quote from the windows and go, okay, it's 18 grand, all right. That's my budget blown, just put them in. No, shop around, get them, get your trades in and get them going to their trade accounts and see if they can get them cheaper. So there's always ways to save money and keeping the cost down. Yeah, sure. So I just want to give some shout outs here because we've obviously got our Facebook group uh, running and last night, just before um, uh, we obviously recorded this today, I put a wee post on the Facebook asking people if they had any things that they wanted us to cover. So let's just rattle through these questions. This will be quite fun here uh, and give some people some shout outs. So we've got uh, John Paul Riley, uh, Riley, he's asked, any tips on where to get cheap carpets, guys? So <laughs> I, think, I think I've used the same carpet fitter who supplies Matt. He's just an independent guy. And, uh, you know, he's, you're talking about probably seven, eight pound a square meter for the carpet. Yeah. I, independent, same as me. Um, through my way, independent, we old guy, does all the stuff. Um, I'm at the point now where I think it's the same price, six, seven pound a square meter. But he, um, because it's me, gives me free fitting and free underlay with, and free gripper with every, with every carpet now so yeah uh, you, you get you get these deals when you start to build up the relationship with these guys carpet's definitely one you can negotiate as well do you know what i mean um so that's that's that one uh james uh, james hogg talk about guys doing the labor uh all the hard graft including trades uh excluding tradesmen so he's talking about he likes to get in there and get his hands dirty and and cut out all the tradesmen trying to do as much as possible himself now what i would say there is the danger of that if you want to become a serious property investor then you're talking, you're, you're t- taking up a lot of your time where you could be out uh, sourcing your next deals and that can potentially stall you a lot. I know you've talked about this in the past, Steve. This is where you see some tradesmen making the mistake. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was really, really bad for it. I've done every single trade and I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not saying 
I, I got a gas fit in. I mean, I fitted the boiler in the properties and then got a gas guy to come in and do the gas safeties when I first started. I didn't, I didn't want to spend money on anything. Um, and then you realize that you've, you're so engrossed in the one project that you end up spending six months in it. And like you say, you've not social your next deal. There's no other plan of attack. When you finish that six months worth of work, you're like, you're so exhausted and worn out. You're like, oh, thank God for that. Because yeah. if, you, if you actually buy better up front or right up front and get the price negotiated in and you, get your, you can afford to actually spend the, the, the refurb um, cost by actually outsourcing it to, to tradesmen and take yourself out of the po point where you're actually doing more useful stuff and stuff that's more valuable, like finding the, the better deals or raising finance to buy another one. Yeah, networking with new investors and all that. Yeah. Um, Robert Ralston's asked, uh, kitchen wraps versus replacing kitchen units. This is one that I don't like the sound of at all. For me, it's like papering over uh, cracks, you know, you're, you're trying to cover up. I just don't like the idea of going over the top of something. Yeah, I mean, I think if the kitchen base units and everything were generally good, I've, I've not done this either, so I'll just state that, but I think if the units are generally good, and it's just the doors that maybe like, the, you know, the pine ones, you right. get the cheaper range that were out maybe 10 years ago, right. 12 years ago. You, yes, maybe the wraps would be a cheap alternative. I don't know the price. I've never done it. I have I seen see. some people, they got some quotes in because there's companies that offer this. And I always wary because, you know, it's, it's always the kind of, sort of bigger companies that are targeted at the kind of consumer market. So people mm. will pay fortunes for this sort of stuff. And that's where the market seems to be more of that rather than like property investors and property developers and stuff. Yeah, I, and I, I never see the point of it when you can get a kitchen for two and a half, three grand from Magnet LMPG, including appliances like, well, are you going to get really get the wrap that much cheaper? And then it's, it's obviously not going to last as long because it's still an old kitchen. You've just kind of polished a turd to a certain extent. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm at, the jury's still out of it for me. This is a really good tip from Raymond's. He's talked about getting kitchens on Gumtree, and I, I absolutely 100% agree here. See on Facebook Marketplace and Gumtree, you can you can get secondhand kitchens. Things <laughs> he's laughing at you. <laughs> and, oh no, no, I totally agree. I'm with Raymond on this. See if it's for a buy to let, right? You boys have probably bought the kitchens. I put the kitchens. That's something he's put them on Gumtree rather than <laughs> stuck them in the skip. <laughs> I wouldn't. I Stephen's kitchens you'll find on on Gumtree the ones that he works out. <laughs> No, I, I would totally agree with Raymond. I think if you if you're not so fussed about getting the if you're not doing the refinance, right, mm. then I think this can work. You know, and you can save quite a bit of money here. Get the second hand kitchen. The problem with that is sometimes it doesn't always go in. You know, there'll be yeah. bits missing, or when you dismantle it, something will break, and then it can be a pain in the ass. Um, so I think kind of match end panels and doors and stuff like that can be a bit uh, tiresome. I think if you're going for a, a, a revaluation, a refinance, then I think you really want to do new. And, and the kitchen's bespoke to the room size and the layout you want as well. So if you've not maximizing the value or the maximizing the space of the property by, you, you're, you're kind of, you're dictated by what you've, your 500 pound kitchen you found on Gumtree, what, where it goes and what place. So yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, you can probably save a few hundred quid on it. Yeah. That's brilliant. Right, cool. That's great. And I'm also just watching the Facebook Live here. I'm seeing another thing popping in uh, from Chris Minchin here. As an agent, I can <laughs> tell you that Magnolia properties take twice as long to lease than white and grey. So definitely no to Magnolia. I tell Chris Minchin if he's not watching the live video, he just tried to call me while we were recording this. So apologies for missing your call. Well, you know what Stephen's like? He'll never answer your calls anyway. Well, I'll get back to you later on tonight. Brilliant. On that note, folks, it's been great, and we we'll look forward to catching up with you uh, next week. Stephen, tell us where the uh, tell us where the listeners can find us. You can find us on. We're both very active on Instagram, not as much Facebook, but um, we're on all the all the platforms: Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks very much, everybody, and speak to you next week. Thanks a lot.